find out which plantation he was sold to in the hope that I could at least find a field uh, where he was buried. Whilst I'm not there yet, I'm certainly much closer than I was when I started out. Clearly, this has been an itch that constantly needs to be scratched. So I thank you all for joining me this, this evening to help me scratch it. I want to start by looking at the numbers of Jacobites alleged to have been executed in Cumberland, that is Carlisle, Brampton and Penrith, only because there are differing numbers, especially in Penrith and Brampton. Now, I do not claim to know the answers to this conundrum. All I want to do tonight is to present my findings and allow you to make up your own decision uh, as to the truth or falseness of the figures that we are given since 1746 through various avenues. So for me, my starting point is the list from James Ray, who was from Whitehaven on the west coast of Cumberland. He was an English historian. Uh, most notable work is his Chronicle of the Jacobite Rebellion of 1745, a complete history, uh, right up to its suppression at the glorious revolution of Culloden. I'm not quite sure what is glorious about Culloden, but this was his title. He published it in 1749. Now, Ray marched to join the royal garrison at Carlisle in the autumn of 1745 at a time when Charles Edward Stuart's army was marching south from Edinburgh. But Carlisle had surrendered before he got there, so he followed the Jacob Jacobite army to Derby. The information he gleaned from his expedition was reported to the Duke of Cumberland, whose forces he met at Stafford on the 5th of January, 1746. And of course he stayed with that uh, army right up until uh, Culloden. So we today should expect his report to be as good as any, given that he witnessed the most important parts himself. But you and I know that history is written by the victors. So we have no way of really knowing if everything he wrote was the exact truth. We have to work from this premise and hope that he was a good historian. The sad fact is that if he wasn't, a lot of people who have followed to write articles and books after him have included his work as being the truth. For example, in his book on page 427 and 428, he states that 37 Jacobites were executed in Cumberland, yet only 31 names are generally spoken of in many modern day books. Maybe I've got it wrong, I'd like us to see. So, in Carlisle on the 18th of October, this is what Ray has in his book. Now, it appears to be consistent throughout all other written records, so there's nothing really wrong with the 18th of October. The S's these are Scottish, that the others unmarked are English, of course. But when we move on to Brampton on the 21st of October, Ray, in his book, he lists nine members who were executed, whereas later lists and all the other books only show six, omitting James Forbes, Robert Morton, and Alexander Hutchinson. These are not even included on the Cape on Tree Memorial. So my question is, well, what happened to the missing three? Or, is, or, or was Ray wrong in the first place? Highly unlikely, but he could have been. When we move on to Carlisle, what's interesting here is that Ray states, and I quote, on Saturday, December the 15th, Sir Archibald Primrose Bart and 10 others were executed at Carlisle, end of quote. This makes 11 men executed. 
yet on all later lists, including the criminal justice list, there are only 10 listed as being executed. The missing name appears to be Molyneux or Michael Eaton, who, by the way, is actually listed as being executed on the 15th of November in the muster roll of Prince Charles's army. And yet he's, he's missed off a lot of lists. So unless he was executed somewhere else on this date, and the others were executed in Carlisle, but why his name does not appear in later lists, I have never elicited any reason. In terms of the 15th or the 16th, it's interesting that there are two dates given the 15th and the 16th. For example, Ray states in his book on page 427, the bottom two lines, and I quote, on Saturday, December the 15th, Sir Archibald, et cetera, et cetera, were executed at Carlisle. Whereas in the no quarter given Master Rolls book, it gives the 15th of November. Now, the other one is 15th of December. Now, in the History of Penrith by Jay Walker, who wrote his book in 1857, he states, and I quote, on the 16th of November, which was the anniversary of the entrance of the Prince's army into the city, that's Carlisle, that is, these were the executions. So clearly, already we've got confusion, misinformation, and contradictory statements, which are rife surrounding this period of history. Perhaps this is how it will always remain. As an aside, Walker, in his 1857 History of Penrith, he adds a footnote, which I quote, we were told in our youth by an old lady who when a girl was present at the execution of some of the rebels at Carlisle, that most of them, all fine young men, were not half dead when cut down. One of them actually struggled with the wretch, here she means the executioner, who opened his bosom to pluck out his heart. The scene, she said, haunted her fancy for half a century, and she never reflected on it without a shudder. It's interesting when you compare Walker's book with Ray's book, it's clear that Walker did not take Ray's names in his book. So my question is, was it between 1749 when Ray's book was published and 1857 when Walker's book was published that those executed at Brampton changed from nine to six? And if so, why and by whom? When we go on to Penrith, on page 428, Ray states, that James Reed was executed with seven others at Penrith, making a total of eight. Yet later lists, including National Archives, only list seven. Whilst Penrith records by local dignitary William Furness in 1894, he lists eight, the missing man being, of course, James Reed, whose name is the only one that appears in Ray's book. Whatever the number is, it is recorded that the three Englishmen, Robotham, Hunt and Holt, suffered undue pain and agony from the butch disemboweling by William Stout. He was the ad hoc executioner, just as several others did at Carlisle and Brampton. Just as an aside, the last person ever to be executed at Penrith was on the 31st of August, 1767, and that was a Thomas Nicholson for murder. Thereafter, all executions were carried out in Carlisle. Now you'd think that the confusion would end there, but sadly not, because in no quarter given in the rolls, Carlisle 28th of the 846, we have two executions, Walter Ogilvy on page 68 and Captain Donald MacDonald, the nephew of Capop, on page 226. There are no records showing where this execution took place or by whom. If this information is correct, then who carried out and where? 
It certainly wasn't William Stout who executed all the other Jacobites at Carlisle, Brampton and Penrith, and it's highly unlikely to have been the king's executioner, Walter Millick, who is recorded as not being available for the task. He didn't do anything in 1746, he just disappeared off the scene. As an aside, he was called Walter Millick because he came from the village of Walter Millick, which was between Penrith and Keswick. This was a close-knit farming community and only those in the village knew his name or identity. Outsiders always saw him in a, in a mask when carrying out his royal duties. So my search intensified for locating the Carlisle burials when I wrote two articles for the Northumbrian Jacobite Societies, 20th anniversary book. And the chapters that I wrote was chapter nine, execution of Jacobites in, Cum in Cumberland and chapter 15, Brampton's Capon Tree. This quickly led on to extensive research into William Stout, the labor executioner from Hexham who for his 30 golden guineas and the personal clothes and effects of the condemned volunteered for the, the, the task despite having no knowledge of how to hang, draw and quarter a man. So if we move on, then we look at the execution sites, looking at Brampton to start with. This is a photograph or a drawing of 1833 of the Capon tree. Sadly, it was reported in one of the local newspapers that trophy hunters were taking parts of the tree till eventually all that was left was a stump. Today, we obviously see it as this. This is the recently planted capon tree in 2013. It's not in the exact spot of the old tree, of course, which is just here. When we think about where the bodies would have been buried, it states in some records that the heads were taken to Carlisle to put on spikes, but the limbs and the torsos were thrown into a pit next to the capon tree. So if this is true, if you look at the capon tree, just in front of the bench, there is a tarmac road. So it's possible in the day when there was no road there that they could have been buried in a pit anywhere around here. Therefore, maybe finding the exact spot may be difficult to say the least. One of the questions that we should ask ourselves is why did they choose this place to execute the prisoners in Brampton? Well, the capon tree was chosen for two reasons. It was on the main crux of the route from the east of England to Carlisle, joined by the main route from the north, that's the Longtown area, and thus every traveller would have to pass the site. Secondly, this was the favourite place where the Newcastle magistrates would stop on their journey to the assizes in Carlisle. Here they would have refreshments under the old capon tree, drink their wine, and rest their weary feet before their final leg to the city courts. Perhaps at the time, the Carlisle commissioners at the sentencing thought it would be a great talking point for later magistrates when they rested there. As an aside to this, I heard a story in Carlisle that at the capon tree, a squared beam was due to hang the men, like this one, and that was, it, the beam was strung between the capon tree and the next nearest tree. I was also told by somebody that in a garage in Hayton, there is an ancient cottage that has the beam above an outhouse that was the actual beam that the men were hung on. I've never found it, um, but this was just something that I'd heard in passing. So we move on to Carlisle. Now, this is the walled city in 1745. Um, this is now facing north at the top and south at the bottom. This is the ancient road at the very top right-hand corner. This 
is the castle on your left, and the black arrow is the execution spot in Harrowby. The trail from the South English Gate to Gallows Hill was quite long. So it's from there to there. You can see now where they had to go. The exact spot of the gallows is now under a garden of a house, once belonging to John Graham. He was a local man who bought the land to build houses on back in the 1800s. He discovered when he was building his house, which is the house that's underneath it, that he discovered the ashes and the burnt remains of their bowels. This reminded him that his father witnessed the Carlisle executions and told him when he was a 10 year old boy and his father had written it down in a book. Now, John Graham, he wrote an article which was published in the Carlisle Patriot on the 10th of October, 1829. This was a drawing done at the time of Carlisle Castle, and you, here you can see the white horse pulling a dredge with one of the prisoners strapped to it. This was obviously a time of great entertainment for the local people. Now, if you have walked from the castle down to the Gallows Hill, and imagine that there was no road, no pavement, that by the time that the prisoners would have got there, they would have been black and bruised and in great pain. But of course, more was to follow. So why Gallows Hill? Why not hang them in the castle where they used to, over the walls there? You can see on the top pillar on the left-hand side, uh, you can see a pole hanging out. That's where they used to hang them. Well, Gallows Hill was a place of execution in the Roman times and I actually thought that it, even before that, when the Celtic races roamed the area, the hill now heavily built on with houses and a hotel was roughly a mile from the city's southern gate, which led to London. It's the highest point around this part of the Solway Basin that Carlisle is surrounded by and is right beside the route that travellers would have to pass to and from the city from London. It is said that the bodies of those executed in Carlisle were said to have been put into an unmarked, unmarked pit in St Cuthbert's Church. On the top right-hand corner, you can see a plaque. It's quite high up on the wall, and it's very difficult to find. It's taken me ages to find it. Um, I'm not quite sure what it looks like. This particular photograph was taken in the 1990s. But when we look at Carlisle St Cuthbert's, this is the back garden. The front of the the church, it used to be the cemetery. It is now a lawned garden. And the policy at the time was that paupers, miscreants and criminals were not buried in the front cemetery as it offended the local people's dignity. So they were put in the small rear piece of ground to the rear of the church, which is this one. This is where the detective work comes in, eliciting what part of the back garden it was. Various accounts state that Sir Archibald Foley's primrose was buried in a makeshift coffin and buried alone in an unmarked grave, whilst other accounts state that his coffin was put in the pit with the other bodies. So either we're looking for one site or two sites. After many visits and discussions with the curator and other local historians, the corner spot that you can see appears to be the most likely spot for the Jacobites to be buried in. The gravestone that's at the back, sorry, I'll just go back, Never mind. just let me, sorry, go back. There was a gravestone behind that. Um, it's interesting that it has been vandalised, so that all the wording has been lost, and perhaps it was an afterthought of someone to put a small memorial 
tablet to the memory of the 20 executed men, and maybe it has nothing to do with our story, whatever it, that happens to be. But now we come to Penrith. This is a map of Penrith in 1746. You can see if my pointer, can you see my pointer moving? This is Penrith town. And it is recorded that the Jacobite site of execution was situated between the White Ox, which is by the first orange arrow, which is now an office block, and the second arrow, which is the old site of Airgill Castle. So what we're really looking for is this corner bit. We don't really need to look at the rest of Penrith. So here is that corner bit, close up. This arrow is the new A6 Penrith to Carlisle Road. But when the Jacobites were executed, of course, you can see the Carlisle Road is the one above it, which is now one single track road that goes over the top of the hill. The X actually is the White Ox, the old White Ox pub. The orange arrow indicates the highest part between the White Ox and Airgill Castle. So this has to be the execution site. You see where the road bends, where it says to Great Selkeld, there is a, like an arrow. That is the start of the new road that goes across Beacon Hill. When they built the Beacon Hill Road, they knocked down most of them, dug up most of where the arrow is, which meant that any part of the, the gibbet, if you like, was totally destroyed. Unfortunately, this is the new road that goes across. And of course, where the blue arrow is, this is full of houses. And the houses actually go along the orange arrow. And below that, in the corner, that is now a children's playing field. The exact spot where the orange and the yellow meet is a bungalow, a large bungalow. And if we are to go by where the execution site is by, the books in Penrith is underneath their back garden. So, our final question has to be, why not execute all the prisoners in Carlisle? Well, the reason being that they chose Brampton, Penrith and Carlisle is that the city fathers sitting on the Trials Commission, felt they needed to send a message to all travellers around the county. And they chose Carlisle and Penrith for no other reason than they were the places holding the biggest markets, both meat and goods, and as such would attract more travellers to and from who would see the sites. Now I'm dyspraxia, I have dyspraxia which means that my left-hand side of the brain doesn't work in sync with my right-hand side. So sometimes I use my logic or maybe illogical thought processes to work things out. So my thinking is given that the bodies were quartered and decapitated and buried immediately in unmarked graves with their heads being taken to Carlisle to be placed on display, as was the usual practice nationally, my logic tells me that travellers passing any of these three execution sites would not see anything other than a tree at Brampton and possibly empty gallows at Penrith and Carlisle, assuming they were not dismantled immediately. This really brings me to the most important part of my talk, which is what, what has been done recently to try and establish the exact burial places at Brampton, K 
Carlisle and Penrith. It's not been easy because very little is written. They all mention William Stout. They all mention uh, various witnesses' statements, but nobody actually says exactly where the pits were. So I'm going to bring the talk to an end because I'm hoping that people can join in a general discussion and I'll tell you what I've done to date. So I've made contact with James Brunskill at Church House Administrator from Carlisle's Diocese Church House at Penrith. He finally, two days ago, concurred that a survey has been carried out within the past 18 months, but that data is not with them yet, as it is still being compiled along with every other church burial site throughout Cumbria, which is part of a national survey. So no statistics will be released until the complete report is ready, and that could be some years. However, he did send me a link to the surveyors who carried out the survey at St Cuthbert's. I rang their office, no one answered, so I sent an email after getting their details from the Registrar of Land Surveyors. Nobody answered. I rang again yesterday and I got the receptionist who said that all the workers were out every day in the field and I needed to make a specific appointment to see someone. I'm visiting their offices tomorrow afternoon, hoping that one of the surveyors will be in to write up their week's work. And I'm hoping that if they are in, that they might, they just might give a hint as to, yes, we have found a pit, an unmarked grave or whatever. Maybe not, we'll wait and see. At the same time, I actually contacted the Land Surveying Department at Newcastle University. They actually run a three-year course on GPR surveying. I asked them if they could give me some advice, how much a geo survey would cost, how long it would take, and what the time scales are for results. I received an email from them this morning, actually from the PA to the head of the department, Professor Sam Turner. He is the head of department. She said that he's away until the end of this month, but she has put my letter at the top of his in-tray. So I wait with bated breath for when he comes back. Finally, for a second opinion, I wrote a letter to the geophysics firm in Barnsley to ask about their costs in carrying out a GPR survey just in case we have to carry that with something else and decide what we wish to do. So, ladies and gentlemen, really, what else can I say other than what do we do next? And I leave it open to an open discussion and any questions that you might have. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much, Frank. I presume everybody can hear me. Um, that was fascinating. It's clear that you have uh, done a huge amount of uh, work and research. Um, whether any of us can offer any <clears throat> greater advice or knowledge or information than you found yourself, I'm not entirely sure. I don't think I can. Um, but it will be very interesting to see how you progress with the... Um, um, the surveys, the underground surveys that uh, might be done by either Newcastle University or the company in Barnsley. Um, I thank you very much indeed for that. I'm just wondering, I won't stop the recording actually, because I think the, the discussion might well worth be uh, uploading uh, to YouTube as well. Uh, Mike can make the decision on that when, uh, when the time comes. So we're still recording at the moment. Uh, if anybody's got any objection to that, please uh, please say so now. And if you'd like to ask questions, please unmute yourself and uh, ask Frank a question. Yeah. Um, can I ask a question? Sure. Frank, first of all, thank you ever so much for that talk, which I found extremely 
stimulating and interesting. I'm particularly interested in the Reverend Robert Lyon and as to where he possibly is interred in a pit in Penrith. Um, I should point out that you, you mentioned Thomas Coppock, but you don't have Reverend in front of him. He was actually the chaplain to the Manchester Regiment. You probably know that. Yes, sure. Um, but I would be really interested to see where Robert Lyon is actually interred, because if we can find these things out, I think at some point uh, the 45 Association might be quite happy to erect a couple of plaques down there in Cumbria uh, at, at these sites. Superb talk. Thank you ever so much. Um, you've done a, an awful lot of work in this so, um, on a very difficult subject. For sure. Uh, I mean, I have had two books um, right. here, which were both based on Penrith, and they both concur that after the executions at Penrith, the torsos and limbs were put in the same pit together and that the heads were taken to Carlisle. Mm -hmm. So I think they're all agreeing mm -hmm. that the, the pits, according to the Penrith and the Brampton, is that it's close by. So in Brampton, it was next to the capon tree, but that doesn't mean whether it's left, right, or anywhere around. And at Brampton, it's possible, it might not be, it might, I might be wrong, but when they built the Beacon Hill Road, they actually dug up that area to put in the road works, if you like, and it, it's possible, slightly possible, that it might be under the tarmac. I don't think so. I've been there several times to look at the playing field. I've walked up to the back garden in the corner and I've got a feeling that it's in their back garden because it, they said it was on the highest point so that anybody coming north or south or, or from Great Selkirk would see it and could, could not miss it. This was the whole point. And it, there were no roads in 1745, they were tracks. Mm -hmm. And I think that the roads may have been built more out from the hedges of where the gallows used to be. So I, I'm holding on to the fact that it's somewhere in that corner hedge where that bungalow is. I haven't yet been to knock on their door and I haven't yet told them what they might have in their garden, but I'm going to have to um, in the pursuance of my research. I'm going to have to try and see what they say. If I, if I suggest that we might do a geo survey at some stage. That's the reason that I wrote to Newcastle. Psychology, as a psychologist, it really tells me that if I put that, that hint, that idea into the head of department's uh, head, he might say, well, our students have to go out on site and do this as an exercise as part of their training. They may do it for free. I don't know, I'm holding my hands open. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wish you all the best. Thank you, Andrew. I think uh, Mike Nevin had his hand raised. Yes, um, I've been in communication with Frank and also uh, was at the site at St. Cuthbert's where we think the Jacobites may be buried. Um, now, the sources you cited, Frank, are secondary sources. I think there are two questions. One is who was executed, when and where? That's the first question. The second question is where are they buried? Um, I had thought there must be primary sources to tell us who was, who was executed, and those would be state sources. As to where they were buried, one would have thought that church sources would give us indication. Now, I said to Frank a list of uh, the, the people I, this is mainly from the muster roll, but um, the muster roll itself relied on obviously on primary sources. But those executed on Saturday, October the 18th, 1746, uh, were Major James Brand, who was a watchmaker for Men and Brothers Hussars, Francis Buchanan of Calendar, Hugh Cameron, Captain in Cameron of Ochil's Regiment, Reverend Thomas Copper, Chaplain of the Red, Manchester Regiment, as Emsley has mentioned. John Henderson of Castle Mains, Donald MacDonald of Chandris, who was the major in MacDonald of Kepox Regiment. He was the one captured 
um, at Falkirk. In fact, he was, he was involved in Rose Castle um, affair when he uh, gave a, a, a white rose to protect the baby. Uh, but he, he made the mistake of trying to uh, hijack one of the officer's horses at Falkirk. He then ran off back to his regiment and he was, um, he was captured. Donald MacDonald of Kinloch Moidart, who's made to Cam uh, of, the, of the McDonald's of Cam Ranald, and John McNaughton, uh, quartermaster of Persia Horse. So those are the ones executed on Saturday, October the 18th. Uh, on Saturday, November the 15th, it's given as November in the Master Roll, not December, Molyneux Eaton, also known as Michael Eaton, who you mentioned, Frank, mm -hmm. uh, Charles Gordon of Turpercy, of Horn of Glenbucket's Regiment, Thomas Hayes of the Manchester Regiment, Patrick Kerr of Strathallan's Persia Horse, Barnabas Matthew of the Manchester Regiment, James Mitchell of Lord Lewis Gordon's Regiment, Patrick Murray, the goldsmith of Stirling, who was a secretary attached to the Athol Brigade, Sir Archibald Primrose of Dunipace of the Zars, Robert Reed, a Piper of Ogilvy, Perthshire Regiment. Um, an alternative source gives him as being executed in York on November 15th. Mm. Alexander Stevenson of Edinburgh, John Wallace uh, Miller of Lenithgow, and possibly also James Thompson of Fingas. Now, if we could identify who was executed and where they're buried, I'd very much be in favour of uh, putting a plaque to their memory at the appropriate place. Um, but I wonder whether by going to Ray, which is a secondary source, and the 18th and the 19th century source, and even our own muster roll, really, if, if Christopher was still with us, what he'd be doing is going back to the primary sources. He'd be going back to court records, mm. to uh, state records of who was executed and also to church records. So I wonder whether whether those are the sources that someone... Right. Um, yeah, in terms of the church records at St Cuthbert's and the, uh, the records were destroyed in 1777 when they knocked down St Cuthbert's and rebuilt it and the records disappeared and that's it so there are no records um, pre-1777 for St Cuthbert's. In terms of uh, Penrith I've been everywhere in Penrith and nobody uh, but nobody uh, can say that there are any records kept in any churches um, or any records. In terms of, you're quite right, Mike, in terms of the primary source, the problem with the primary source is that if you look at some of the roles, even in Carlisle Castle, those two names that they showed you um, who were executed in Carlisle are not recorded anywhere. So one, one has to say, our records, even the primary source, are, are they correct? Or are people adding on or taking out as time goes on? We have a number of people uh, with their hands raised, and I'm anxious that everybody gets a, a shot oh, at please. it. Yes, please. I think um, the next person I noticed with a hand raised is Craig Durham. Yeah, thank, thanks. Um... Frank, uh, yeah, so one for me. This this the G, G, GPR, I think it's ground proximity radar or something. Is it? Have you mm -hmm. have you got any examples of where this has been used to successfully identify grave sites? Is it, is it a common technique for that? Well, yeah, they've just the nas the national. It's a national uh, uh, thing that they're doing all graveyards uh, in England, and Cumbria has just been finished. And the firm who do it use GPR as a means of identifying if there are bodies underneath. They can't tell who they are, of course, but they can tell you if there's one body, um, which is why I've been trying now for a year to get the Carlisle Diocese to at least release some of that information. And they can't because they're tied to the national surveyors department who are going to produce the report. Uh, that's who I'm going to see tomorrow in the hope that they might say 
Well, we can't tell you the data, but if you ask a question, we might be able to answer yes or no, in which case I would ask the question, have you got in the rear garden uh, un unmarked graves of multiple bodies? Because there'll be body parts, there won't be full bodies, there'll be just arms and legs and torsos. So if they would give that, at least we have something to go on. And if, we, if there's any way of knowing how many arms and legs there, we might then be able to work out exactly how many people were executed there. Now, if, if it's right that uh, Archibald Primrose was buried in a wooden coffin and buried with the others executed, because he was only hung, if that is correct, has he, done, has he done damage to the bones? Is it laid on top? Is it underneath? These are all the things that a GPR would actually tell us by saying what they can see. And I've seen some of their results on their national GPR things, and they're very good. Now, I don't know how expensive or cheap it is, which is why I was hoping that Newcastle um, might suddenly say, well, we'll do it out of them um, because our students need the field practice. I don't know. But I, I do agree that it's um, we need to have it done. We're never going to get anywhere unless we know, even at the capon tree, are there nine or the six? We, we have no idea until we actually have this, this, this survey done. Thank you, Craig. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks. I, guess, uh, I mean, I, I don't know whether it's expensive or, or, or cheap, uh, Frank, but I would imagine it's pretty pricey. Um, so, I mean, if we could get um, Newcastle University yeah. involved, that would be um, absolutely excellent, or, or any other academic body in, in the area. Um, as sure. you know, they need to do this sort of thing in the field for experience and practice, so I think it's a possibility. Anyway, unless I apologise if I'm not doing these questions in chronological order, I think we've got 21 participants still, still with us, and I can only see 11 pictures. So I think the next uh, hand I've got raised is Ian Weir. There we are. Um, Frank, thank you for a fascinating talk. That really was good. Um, what comes to my mind, we have two scenarios. We have Penrith and Brampton, where the bodies are cast into a pit, or the torsos are cast into a pit. We have Carlisle, where the bodies are put in consecrated ground. Significance in that, do you think? Um, the other thing, I've, I've been scribbling down notes. Mm. Um, if we're talking about the primrose body being in a coffin, um, just thinking the, the horrible practicality of that, you open a grave, what's going to be easier for those interring the bodies or parts thereof? I would think you would put the coffin in first and then parts on top because that's going to be far more stable than trying to put a coffin on top of parts uh, so that might help your survey um, to pick up on Mike's point about primary sources I, I would expect that there would have been warrants issued by the authorities to the governor of Carlisle Castle to say, right, we now have permission to remove A, B, C, D, and E and take them away for execution. So that would be a written source. Where that written source is, if it survives, is the big question, I think. Um, but as I said, what really leaps out at me is why should some in consecrated ground and some just in a burial pit that we assume was not consecrated. Any thoughts on that? Please? Yeah, yeah, actually, um, the rear garden to the St Cuthbert's actually was not part of the, the normal cemetery, it was not consecrated. Um, when I asked Irene if there are any records of when it was consecrated, when it was uh, turned into a, a cemetery, I was there two days ago actually, in the middle of the grass to the rear of the church is a huge big monument to lots of other names 
And when I inquired, where did it come from? Apparently, these were the ashes of people who were buried in the back garden. Uh, once the front garden was stopped being used um, as a cemetery. Mm -hmm. So it's possible, I don't know, it's possible that in 1745 it was not consecrated, in, in which case it was just a garden. Now, all the, all the gravestones that are against the wall in that back part come from the front cemetery. Mm -hmm. And the only one that's vandalised is the one underneath the bush, right next to the corner. And, and it's not whether it's been literally chiselled out, somebody has, has destroyed whatever was on it. If you look to the right of that, you'll see all along the wall to the gate leading into that, there's lots more um, stones from the front. So why this one's on its own, why it's under a bush, why it's been defaced, I have no idea. And Irene has no idea. And she said that in 1777, when they rebuilt the church, records were just lost, destroyed, or we have no idea. Mm. Okay. Um, can, I, can I just make a quick point there? Uh, the business of people been buried in unconsecrated grounds um, the fact that these men were tried for treason would probably mean that they would just be dumped anywhere and that they wouldn't care whether they were put in consecrated ground because they were regarded as pariahs really in society in the same way as a suicide victim would not have been buried in consecrated ground. So there may be that aspect to it as well. Um, I, I suspect that the Judiciary wouldn't be too concerned about the finer points of uh, no. spirituality as regards the deceased in this sense. It's just the reason is just dumb anyway. Mm. I'd be wrong in saying that, but given that, given the fact that suicide victims would not, suicide people would not be buried in consecrated property, there's maybe an argument there as well. Mm -hmm. no, I think you're right because obviously at Brampton. That's that's unconsecrated ground beside yeah, the Cape yeah. on Tree, and and Penrith is it was just by the roadside. Yeah. Why yeah. Carlisle, Carlisle was different, I have no idea. Sure. Maybe it's I don't know why they didn't bury them on Gallows Hill, you know, where the bowels and the ashes were. I have no idea yeah. what their thinking was because there's nothing written down about it. Okay, thank you, Emily. Um, Richard Knight. Thank you. Um, sources, people have mentioned primary sources. Uh, for the last 10 years since I retired, I've been uh, working with a small group of volunteers at the National Archives, uh, describing and cataloguing the state papers. Um, we started with George II, SP 36. These records, uh, about 50% of them, are concerning the judicial process by which the Jacobite rebellion was dealt. They're meticulous, they're very accurate, and I'm quite surprised that there's any dispute as to the number of people, the identity of the people who were executed. Um, my, uh, not all the cabinet minutes survive, but those which do lead me to believe that every Jacobite that was executed after the 45 was discussed in cabinet. It was not a kangaroo court process, as some writers have suggested, it was uh, a meticulous process uh, undertaken for a reason. And um, I think the, uh, the records, the state papers ought to be regarded as definitive in the identity of those who were executed, uh, not only, you know, in all the sites where they were executed, not just in, uh, in, in Cumbria. Um, so, you know, I, I think that, you know, there's, Someone mentioned warrants. Those exist in Treasury Solicitor Series 18. Um, I think the documentation is there to determine as close as you can definitively who was executed. Great. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you.